Hey, what's up, guys? So uh, here's kind of an interesting little project I've been working on lately. Uh, this is a Geiger counter. Um, and I just want to apologize in advance. I don't know anything about nuclear physics. So if I sound a little stupid about radiation particles, I apologize. It, this is just something that I thought was kind of cool to build uh, just to have around. Um, not actually going to use this for uh, radiation detection. But anyway, so we got a lot going on here. Uh, we have a 5 to 500 volt uh, DC to DC converter that's regulated via a pick. So the whole control is, is taken care of by an 8 pin pick. Uh, because the Geiger, the Geiger Mueller tube actually requires 500 volts to operate. Um, we also have a comparator, comparator detection system going on over here. So we actually, that's where we're detecting the counts. The counts are then fed into a standalone Arduino over here. Um, and then we actually run the little piezo buzzer and uh, a little LED whenever we get a count. I don't know if those are coming in clear on the camera or not, but um, so then from there we actually also have a, a, a USB a serial converter. So we're sending some data out to the computer to graph a little bit using processing. Let me see if I can rotate this over there. So there's a, a little processing program that just kind of runs and and shows the counts per minute in real time. So and updates every second. So I'll go over the processing code. I'll go, I'll go over the uh, the PIC code for the regulation circuit. We'll go over the DC to DC converter basics. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Geiger tube, the detection circuit. We'll even go into the Arduino code because that's kind of cool too, how it does the uh, counts per minute. And I know it's a lot of overkill here, and obviously you wouldn't do this if it was a commercial product, but you know we get the the time and whatever. So. Uh, eventually I want to put something like this on there too so we have like a nice little display of the counts per minute um, and you know again I don't even know if this thing works I don't have anything that's giving off any radioactivity so again everything I'm showing you here is just kinda what I think is right so that's just a little disclaimer I wanted to put on this so let's start talking a little bit about the circuit let's start walking through this thing alright so let's talk about the DC to DC converter that generates 500 volts from 5 volts. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot of voltage. So I just want to put out a quick disclaimer. Be very careful when dealing with this voltage because it will rock you. So make sure you've got some kind of meter out there. You've got some, some kind of load to discharge the capacitors. Um, because your meter itself acts like a load so you need something else because if you remove the meter then there is no load and if you touch that part of the circuit you will get a nice shock so anyways just want to put that out there right away it should be obvious but just be careful okay so anyways let's talk about this converter so we've got 5 volts and we need to somehow generate 500 volts this is the general uh, circuit for a DC to DC boost circuit configuration. So we go in, we go through an inductor, then right here we have a, sorry I am bad at symbols. We've got something that kind of looks like this. That's a MOSFET. That's what I used. It just pretend that's a switch. Then over here we go into a diode, then we have some capacitor and some resistor. Okay, this is all tied to ground. And here's your 5 volt, your common point. Okay, so we need to make 500 out of that 5 volts. This is a DC to DC converter boost circuit, so there's, there's two things that could happen here. This MOSFET could be on or it could be off. When it's on, you the 5 volts here generates a current down to ground, like that. And the inductor charges up. By the way, I'm going to simplify this. If you actually want to go through and calculate all of this, the actual currents and voltages here, go ahead. But I'm not going to get into that in this video. So what happens is you charge this up. 
when this MOSFET is on, that is the on time. Then, when you switch it off, the magnetic field collapses. Collapses onto the inductor windings and you generate a huge voltage. Basically, it's simple as that. Okay, that voltage plus the 5 volts then forward biases this diode here and charges this capacitor over here. Because what we have to do, first of all, let's just assume that this is 499 volts, okay, when the switch is on. That means we need to generate 500 volts, right? I'm just saying, I mean, it's more like, you know, 499.7 more than this diode. So it's like a peak just kind of circuit. Whenever this is a little bit more than this, we get some current flow and we charge up the capacitor. Okay, so when this is on, this voltage, let's just say, goes down a little bit. So this is at 500 volts, and we charge up this. Okay, pretty simple, right? That's how it, the whole circuit works. Now, this on time and off time is when things get a little tricky, okay? We're going to call the duty cycle, okay? You might have heard that term used a lot in PWM, and that's exactly how we're going to gate this MOSFET. The duty cycle is equal to the percent of your total time that you're on. So if you're at 100% duty cycle, that means you're on all the time. The switch never opens. If you're at 50% duty cycle, that means it's half on, half off. If you're at 90% duty cycle, that means you're at 90% of the time you're on. Okay. And by the way, this entire circuit is operating in the discontinuous mode, which means the current through here is discontinuous. It means during our on time, we're charging up the current to some level here, and we'll call this the on time. But then during the off time, the current discharges very quickly and then falls to zero. So if this is your total time here, the current hits zero and sits there until you're on again. So this whole period is off from here to here. Okay, that's what discontinuous mode of operation. And by the way, this point from on to off, the polarity of the voltage here switches because at one point, when you're charging it, it's kind of like a load, right? So you're putting your 5 volts here, and this is positive and minus. But then when it discharges, since the magnetic field collapses on it, it becomes a source. So then this becomes minus plus, which is, gives you that, um, the, the addition effect, and that's how you uh, generate that huge voltage. Okay, So I just wanted to point that out. That's how the DC-DC converter works. Um, now I just want to just show one more quick thing, just because you probably wonder, well, how do you get this this huge voltage? You can think of a capacitor kind of like a voltage source, right? Um, and just from Ohm's law, let's just consider that's a voltage source. So from Ohm's law, the current of that is equal to V over R, right? The voltage is fixed, but let's say the resistance goes to uh, zero. Zero resistance. That means your V over zero gives you infinite current, so huge currents. Let's think of the inductor, then, as a current source. This is just a way of thinking about this, why we're getting this huge, huge spike in voltage. That means the voltage, then... Let's just think about Ohm's law. I know this isn't entirely accurate. I know a lot of the guys that understand this are thinking thinking about the calculus involved here. But V, then, is equal to I R. So the current here is fixed because we're going to consider this a current source. So when my resistance, then, goes to infinity or open circuit, so when you break it, then that means this is infinity, which gives me infinite voltage. Okay, just think about it like that. The true way of thinking about it, though, of course, is voltage across an inductor is equal to LDI dt. 
So if you solve for voltage and you switch, you blow open your, uh, if you want to change your current very quickly, then yeah, your voltage, or I mean, yeah, so zero time, then your voltage goes very high. And of course the current through a capacitor is equal to C dV dt, and the, the Ds are change, change in voltage over the change in time. Okay, anyway, moving on. All right, so in my circuit, what I did, I have a, uh, a MOSFET in there. I'm not sure exactly which one it is. You might want to experiment around with, with a few different MOSFETs. Um, I think it's, it's something that can handle. I kind of want to look at it now and see what it is exactly. It is an IR. It's an IRF820 N channel MOSFET. We have a thousand volt. Uh, a diode and then we have three and this is important I want to talk about this for a second we have three point oh one three point oh one microfarad capacitors in parallel so we actually have point oh three microfarads sitting there Okay, this is important because I don't want you guys using big capacitors because it's really not necessary. We're going to have very small loads out here, so it's not necessary to have major capacitance. Okay, and if you do charge up a big capacitor, then it gets very dangerous. Okay, actually there's a few more things I, f I found out while designing this circuit here. So let's just, that's the diode we'll call. It's awful. Okay, here's the capacitor. That's we'll call that the capacitor bank. Your meter is when you have it across your load is going to be about 10 mega ohms. So it's not like you always want to have your meter across your load. So when you design this circuit, you're going to find that with or without the meter, you're going to have a different voltage out there. So what I actually did was put two resistors in series here. Each of them is two mega ohms. Or I mean one mega ohm, but they equal two mega ohms together. So I have two one mega ohm resistors in series. And what this does for me, this does for me is this creates a low resistance path here. So when I put a high resistance path like a meter across that it won't affect the voltage here I'm not loading it down any more than it already is 2 mega ohms compared to 10 mega ohms is a pretty big difference it does affect it slightly a little bit but I wanted to make the circuit robust enough that it wouldn't become unstable if I heavy loaded it or shock unloaded it so if I ripped the 10 mega ohms off it wouldn't then fly through the roof okay so that's kind of an important thing to do um, finally, another thing I did right across the load, and we're getting to the Geiger part of this thing. I told you this video is probably going to be long. Okay, so another thing I did, though, was I wanted to feed in, so like I said, I have my two loading resistors that are each one meg, and then I have my cap bank here. Okay, and then here's the DC to DC. Another thing I wanted to do here was bring voltage feedback into the PIC controller so that I knew exactly what it was. But remember, I don't want to load this circuit down. So, I mean, you could, what I wanted to do was then is pick a voltage divider here that would bring my voltage down to TTL voltage levels, like 5 volts. And some type of analog signals that I could feed back into the PIC so that I could regulate this circuit or just monitor it, you know, in case it goes out of crazy, I can at least shut it down. Okay, so you have some resistance RA and RB, and that's pretty easy to figure out, but it needs to be high. So I figured that a thousand, I wanted a thousand volts to equal five volts with this voltage divider circuit. And you know, they use circuits like this for major, you know, major industrial products that do have high voltage. Um, but again, remember, you can't just pick a 1K and a 2K, blah, 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 because that's going to load that down harder than my two 1 mega ohm resistors. So this needs to be like 10 mega ohms 
here. And I think that's actually what I used. Let's take a look here. Um, kind of hard to see exactly what I did here. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I did. I think I did 10 mega ohms and then a 100 ohm. Something like that. I don't know if that sounds right. We can go ahead and, and figure that figure that out really quickly, though. 10 mega ohms would probably be a good place to start. I don't know. I guess you guys are probably bored of this. I'm telling you, man, you guys go ahead and bail out of this video if you get bored. So we need to solve for this to give 1,000 volts equal to 5 volts. Okay, it's pretty simple. 1,000 minus 5. I'll just do this really quickly just to show you. So we'll go 1,000 minus 5 gives me some voltage drop across the 10 mega ohm. So we'll divide that by 10 mega ohm. Now we have the current equaling through this 10 mega ohm resistor must equal the current through R. So that's equal to 5 minus R, right? So just doing a little bit of math here, we go 1,000 minus 5 divided by, yeah, I can't do 1,000 minus 5 in my head. <laughs> 10 E6 gives us some tiny, tiny current. 5 then divided by, oops, 5 divided by that gives me 50, about 50K. So I used 50K here, but it's not exact. So what I actually did, <laughs> This is getting pretty crazy. So what I actually did here was I took two 100Ks. I put one 100K here. I put another 100K here. So in parallel, that gives me 50K. Plus, I put a little um, trim pot here, a 10K trim pot here. So and this is like a little knob, so that I could actually trim the, this so that I did have exactly this voltage. And I picked a 1,000 because I thought that would be a good idea. So 500, so when I'm at 500 volts on my meter, I wait and look and make sure that I have 2.5 volts here, basically, right? And that all feeds back into the pick. Okay, that's a good way of doing it. A uh, few things about this part of the circuit that goes back. Let me just rewrite all of this. All right, so we have your voltage divider here. We have could potentially have a 1,000 volts there with 5 volts here. Um, a good practice to do here would be to use a clamping diode like this to your 5-volt line because, you know, the whole circuit's running off of 5 volts. This goes into my pick, my analog input on my pick. If this signal ever gets larger than what my pick can handle, higher than 5 volts, this diode will will clamp that signal up. So even if it's like a tiny little spike, it'll just conduct and kind of get rid of that for me. It should be a pretty fast acting diode, like a Schottky diode. I don't know what I used, probably something not right. In fact, I even put a, I'm just looking at my circuit now, I put a uh, 0.1 microfarad capacitor in there just to sort of, you know, weed out a little bit of that noise and kind of slow things down a little bit so it's not flying all over the place. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty much the gist of the DC to DC converter. Now we can talk about the Geiger part of the circuit. And again, if you guys ask me for schematics, I don't. What I'm writing right here is about it. Sorry. Okay, so like I said, we have my cap bank here. Then we have my two mega ohm resistors in series. Okay, then this 500 volts goes out to, we have 500 volts here, goes through a 10 mega ohm resistor. Uh, by the way, these caps, I don't know if I mentioned, are like rated for like 680 volts or something crazy like that. Make sure those are rated for high voltage. Uh, 10 mega ohms. This goes to the anode of my Geiger tube. So it's kind of has like, this thing is sort of like a, 
a cylinder looking thing like this and it's got like this little pin that you can solder to here and dangle a wire over that's the anode and they say to keep this 10 mega ohm resistor as close to that as possible then there's like a piece of wire that hangs off and that's your uh, cathode or your ground lead okay so I wired that to the anode I think people draw these Geiger counters like that and then I wired the cathode not to ground I wired the cathode through a 100k resistor okay now you're probably asking yourself what's the point of that well as it turns out that when radiation any particle hits the Geiger tube it shorts out it becomes a dead short some sort of electron avalanche something happens inside the tube and it shorts the anode to the cathode okay what that does for me then is I then have a new voltage divider here's my signal right here so then we have 500 volts here being regulated through 10 mega ohm through short then through 100k so you can actually figure that out quickly we'll go uh, I'll draw it out first 500 divided by 10 plus 100k 10 meg plus 100k times the 100k because that's the current through the whole thing then times this gives me the voltage here and I think it turns out to be 500 times 100k divided by probably don't have to put that 100k in there plus 100 ah, crap 100k yeah it gives me 4.95 volts which is perfect for my input right okay so we've got our now we know how the Geiger tube works and gets our signal there's a couple more things we got to talk about so now we have this signal coming in which could be 4.95 but again we should put some sort of clamping diode or something on this I actually decided to use a uh, Zener diode here at uh, 5.1 5.1 volts hopefully you can see that okay that goes into a comparator circuit and we'll talk more about that I think I'm using an LM211 okay plus minus and this output here now what this has here and I'll talk about this comparator circuit a little bit 5 volts ground with a sweeper uh, actually the sweeper is here alright so what the comparator circuit is going to do is uh, allow us to adjust the sensitivity of our final output signal here oh this is an LM211 which means it's an open collector output which is like uh, if you don't know what an open collector output is I should draw that real quick so here's a transistor this is a collector the emitter is tied to ground so basically what this output here is this pin here so when it turns on it will ground this but as we know an open collector requires a pull up resistor okay so I actually have a 10k out here alright so here's the circuit what happens is, is we'll get a signal here and it is compared against the signal here which could be this is a pot by the way so it could be anywhere between 5 volts and ground so you can adjust that and the way a comparator circuit works and this is just a simple op amp the way the circuit works is anytime the positive signal is greater than the minus signal or the non-inverting you know you have the non-inverting input and the inverting input we'll just call them the positive and minus inputs whenever a signal is greater in the at the positive input than the negative input the output will go on in this case it will actually pull this signal um, it'll actually pull this signal low okay just because it is an open collector output so it enables the output whenever 
Then whenever the signal is less than the minus input, the signal will be high because of the pull-up resistor. Hopefully that makes sense a little bit. So it allows you to adjust at which point will trigger the output. So when I have a signal like at 0.6 volts, I can adjust this so it's greater than 0.6, like 0.7 volts, and it will ignore that. If I make this signal 0.6 volts here, and you can measure this too, here, you know, with your meter until you want to get your sensitivity just right. Um, okay, what I actually did though, was I took my pot here, you know what I'll do? I'll actually do it. I don't think you can hear it. You might be able to see it. I should have a uh, screwdriver somewhere out here. Let's see if I can do it because I do have this pot set up. All right, I'm going to lower it now. Hear that? I don't think you might be able to see it, but the LED goes nuts. I'm, which means I'm right at the threshold of all the noise and crap going on. So if you're at some noise level here with your input, this output will just swing around the same um, as your, your input noise. And yeah, you could add some hysteresis to this and all that, but I didn't decided not to do that just because I just want those clicks fast as possible. And again, this isn't a medical grade Geiger counter. Okay, so then the output of that goes into an Arduino um, interrupt pin. I think digital pin too, and I attach it as an interrupt. So let me think if there's anything else I should tell you about. Um, the voltage that feeds into this inductor, which by the way is 100 micro Henry's. I picked it up from Radio Shack. I think it's like an RF coil. Should have mentioned that before. Eh, oh well. It's 100 micro Henry's. Um, you should have a big cap here. I think I have a thousand microfarads because you know it basically it basically is just being dead shorted, you know, through a switch down to ground. So you should have a pretty nice hefty capacitor there, and this would be your five volt incoming power. Okay, I think. That's good to talk about. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the PIC microcontroller that uh, handles the DC to DC converter. Um, I decided to use a PIC 12F683, and I, I really love this PIC. I'm using a 20 megahertz external crystal for the clock. Um, here's a pin out of it. I'm using, obviously, the through-hole version. Um, I believe I'm using analog or GP0 general purpose I.O. here. Um, GP0 as an LED. I'm using GP1 as my analog input. And I believe, I think I have that backwards. Oh, no, I'm right. And I'm using GP2 as my, uh, as to drive my MOSFET, right? So actually there's a, right off of this pin here, I have a 100 ohm resistor going to the gate of the MOSFET, and then I have a pull down resistor of 10K. So I'm pulling the, the uh, MOSFET gate low, and that's always a good practice to do. I should have mentioned that. I think I'll put a comment in there. Uh, GP3 as the... Uh, the uh, clear pin, the uh, the reset pin, whatever. So I'm doing standard practice with that. I think I'm pulling it up t with a 10K, and I'm using the, by the way, I'm using a Picket 2 to program the device in circuit. Oh, I don't know if this is going to open. Oh, yeah, it did. I'm going to go to the user guide here because I get asked a lot of questions this. I have a video showing how to set up the Picket 2, but I'll just do this anyways real quick to show you a picture. If you go to the user manual, you can pull this up, uh, and this is exactly how I have it set up in my circuit. So I have the picket two tied directly here. Actually, the what's interesting is the 12F680. What is it again? 12F683 actually recommends a certain uh, way of configuring that clear pin. Let me find out where it is. And I'll show you that. 
I don't know where it is. I'm gonna have to do a little bit of digging here. Uh, let's just do an MCLR. <laughs> Sorry, but I I never prepare for these videos. I swear. So I think they have a recommended circuit for the MCLR pin. Uh, where is it? I swear I saw it in here. And it's always a good idea to dig through this manual, especially for your clock setup. Uh, this has got to be it, right? Ah, here we go. So, yeah, if you look here at this picture, they show a 100-ohm resistor first into the pin. So they don't recommend that you just pull it up directly. And you should never just attach the MCLR pin to your 5-volt source or your power source. I found that out. That's... That's actually kind of risky to do with a pick. I guess it has a lot to do with the uh, electrostatic discharge, you know, like the static discharge of the pin. But anyways, what I did here was do this exact circuit. I have a 100 ohm resistor there. I have a 10K here, and I have a 0.1 microfarad capacitor here. And then with that circuit, I took... Oh, did I close that? So right here is the 100 ohm resistor. Here would be that 10K and the 0.1 microfarad. And then I do have this diode here. I didn't use the 470 ohm. I have the diode here. And then my MCLR pin off of my Picket 2 header goes right to this pin. Okay. And then I actually uh, have this here, these data and clock lines tied directly in. But what's funny is if you go over to uh, this circuit. Ah, oh, crap. I got to go back all the way up. If you go to, darn it, here, oh, there it is, I just wanted to show you this. So if you look here, I have the, um, let's see where the clock, here we go. So we have the in-circuit serial programmer data line here and the clock line here. But remember, I'm actually using this line as my analog input, which could be zero. So when that's zero, that voltage, you know, this is my analog input. This pin doesn't seem to work for uh, programming. So I actually had to tap off and put a 1K ohm resistor. Actually, I used the 10K here. I should have showed that in my schematic or when I was drawing that out. But I have a 10K here first. So you have your normal analog pin you would tie in. But I just put a 10K ohm resistor here. And then this circuit works. And also, you know that big cap I showed you across uh, the line? Uh, you actually have to remove that in order to program this in circuit because um, when this, when the picket 2 boots up and it looks at the VDVS, it's almost like in short circuit because a capacitor, when, you've, when you're looking at it not charged, is basically like a short. And a capacitor that big will actually affect the picket 2. So anyway... Getting back to the code. Okay, so here's the code. I'm using micro C. Um, very easy to work with, easy to use. I love the libraries. Uh, just Google micro C uh, to get the latest version. It's free. I, I think they have a limit on how much code you can write. So if you're doing something major, I wouldn't recommend using this. But for the most part, it's pretty easy. Okay, so let's go through the code now. First thing you want to do is go to project, edit project. Let's set up the clocks. Um, obviously, you do a lot of this when you do a new project. We're using the 12F683, 20 megahertz. Uh, we're using the high speed. That's kind of interesting. Anyways, I have it set up here for the high speed. For some reason, I was thinking I would have been in the XT. But anyways, I'm using the high-speed oscillator here. Um, I don't even know if that's... Yeah. For some... you got to be really careful with this. Always look at the data sheet and, and make sure you pick the right oscillator. Um, MCLR pin it, uh, enabled. Always make sure this is enabled. You don't ever want to disable that. Uh, let's see. Anything else in here? No. Nothing else. But anyways, that's that. you just want to go in there and set up your clock. Make sure everything's right. Okay, so let's start off with the code. We have a main loop here. And then within the main loop is your infinite loop, which is kind of like your void loop in the Arduino. Okay, so that's contained within it. So this right here, this little bit of code is your setup code. 
So let's start off. We have a few variables, no big deal. We set up the analog input. So since it's analog input one, that would be a binary total of two or hexadecimal two. So we set that up because a one means input. Uh, this is your comparator configuration setup. Um, there's, I believe, three comparators on board. We disable them all by either making them all zero or all ones. So all ones would give you a seven. All right, one plus two, three plus four, seven, yep. All right, we have uh, general purpose uh, pin two is an output. So try state dot bit two is zero. Uh, bit one will be the, um, do I have that right? Yeah, right. But zero is, I don't know why I have this called out. Boy, that doesn't look right. <laughs> I'm just looking here. It looks like I kind of screwed things up a little bit there. Anyways, I got to comment that out. I was going to say, I have two. Oh, I think something just happened. Anyway. Yeah, I got to be careful here. But anyways, Bit zero is an output. That's my LED. I don't know why I have this piece of code in here. Let me get rid of that. Anyways, good thing I'm doing this video, finding little bugs. Anyways, yeah, my bit zero is my LED, so that's an output. All right, now we're going to use the PWM library. And if you go into here, make sure you have all the libraries. One of them is the PWM library. We're going to initialize this at 16 kilohertz. Okay, that means our total on time um, is going to be uh, with a period at 16 kilohertz. I believe that's 1 over 16 kilohertz. That is 6. Do I have that right? 1 over 16. That's going to be 62.5 microseconds. Oh, yeah, that's right. Per So that's... 62 microseconds total per period. That's your on plus your off times. Okay. Do I, I don't feel like that seems a little, for some reason, I don't know why that seems low to me. I might be right, though. 1 divided by 16 kilohertz. Yep. Okay. Anyway, get me out of this. <laughs> so 16 kilohertz is our switching frequency, and then we do a PWM start. And what we do here right off the bat is set our duty cycle to one, okay? Now remember, what one is gonna mean, okay, I gotta talk a little bit more about this. Your duty cycle in here is gonna go from zero to 255. So zero would be 0%, 255 would be 100% duty cycle. Okay, so it's got a, it's got a resolution of 255, right? So 255 bits. So 127 would be about 50% duty cycle. So you got to remember that. So if you put in 100 here, you're not actually getting 100%. You put in 255 to get 100% duty cycle. So I start things off with one. And, and by the way, when you guys are doing your uh, first layouts, start it off at one. You know, play around with different switching frequencies. Start it off with one, ramp it up to two. Don't just come out of the gate with 100% duty cycle. You want to ramp this thing up slowly. Okay, so the first thing we do is read in analog input one, which is the 500 volt feedback, which remember that voltage divider. So it should be about 2.5 volts. This is going to be read in, in, a, in a 10 bit uh, value. So it's going to be from 0 to 1024. Okay, so you need to sort of figure out what voltage would be 500 volts within that. Right, so 2.5 volts, 5 volts mean equaling 1024, 2.5 is about half of that, which is about 500 something. Anyway, moving on. What we do here now is a little switcher. So if the reference is greater than the feedbacks, this is all backwards. <laughs> okay, let's, the feedback is actually what we want it to be. Let's skip over that and then just come right down here. We'll come back to that in a second. Here is where we actually set the duty cycle, and we're gonna set it to the output variable. That's what I'm calling it, okay? And then down here is simply what we're doing with the LED. So 
I'll come back to this in a second. I just want to talk about what we're doing down here. So GPI GPIO.bit0 is equal to 1. That's setting the LED high. So what I'm doing here is anytime the output duty cycle is less than 150, which it gives me what duty cycle? 150 divided by 255. That is 58%. So anytime my duty cycle is less than 58%, I just want the LED to be on all the time. Okay, now that that just lets me know, yeah, things are good because if your duty cycle is higher than that, the MOSFET will start to heat up. You know, if your on time is significantly longer than your off time, that means you're charging it up a lot longer than you're discharging. And the longer you charge for, the more current goes through the MOSFET and that equates to more heat, okay, and more heat through your inductor, which might not be necessary. So anyways, I set this up then is when the duty cycle is greater than 150 or less than 170, we do a little bit of a blink on that. So on for 10 milliseconds, then off. Then if the duty cycle hits 170, then I want this thing to blink a little bit uh, slower, basically. So on for 50 milliseconds, off for 50 milliseconds. I should have showed this too in my video. This just gives me the status of the duty cycle. Now let's go back up to the regulator. So we read in the analog value, and we'll, we're calling this reference. So let's say the reference we're getting back is greater than our set point. The set point is feedback, okay? If it's greater than the set point, that means we need to bring the duty cycle down a little bit. So we're actually taking the output, which is the duty cycle, and subtracting it by one, okay? The other way around is if our feedback we're getting is less than our set point, that we, means we need more voltage. So we'll increase the duty cycle by one. If the duty cycle ever gets above 200 for whatever reason, this regulator, that means we're calling for a lot of, a lot of voltage we don't want. We'll, we'll limit it at 200 so it can never hit 255, okay? And then, you know, and also I, I set this whole thing up so that, you know, if we get up there, I thought I had another switch on here. But anyways, um, if the duty, if the output is ever less than zero for whatever reason, if it just keeps ramping down to zero, um, just clamp it at zero. So we limit it at zero there. There's some other code here I was doing, but forget about that. So it's pretty simple. When your feedback voltage is ever greater than what you want it to be will decrease will decrease the duty cycle so we're, we'll apply less voltage if the feedback voltage is ever less than what we want it to be we'll give it more voltage so it's regulating it's sort of oscillating around 500 volts and i'm actually trimming this value with that pot in the feedback circuit so i could sort of regulate where i want it to be and you're going to have to play around with the switching frequency and these duty cycle things to actually find out where your sweet spot is in your circuit, okay? And you really don't want a circuit that can go fly off the rails to a thousand volts, right? So don't, you know, make sure you're, you're pitch using uh, values that uh, are realistic. And if things do lose control, you're not going to fly, th you know, and destroy your Geiger tube or, or destroy your anything else, you know, because a lot of these caps are only rated for like 600 volts. Okay, so that's pretty much that that code. Um, what else was I going to say? Well, I think that's it for that code. I'm sure I'll think of something and I'll come back to this. But also, you know, even if, uh, one other thing about switching frequency, even if you hit your, your target at like 20, 20 kilohertz, that might not be a good place to be. It might actually cause more heating of your MOSFET because you are switching it faster, which could cause more heating. So that's the other thing is you want to kind of find that sweet spot. Okay, so that is the code for controlling 500 volts. Now let's jump over to the Arduino code. I actually have to open up Arduino here. And then, of course, we'll talk a little bit about the processing code. No, I'm good with that. Actually, I'd rather have it centered here. Okay, this code is very, very simple. 
All right, so we've got some variables going on here. We do a setup. We attach an interrupt to zero, which happens to be digital pin two, I believe. We're going to call. We want it to go to um, to uh, subroutine Geiger count when it happens. And remember, we have an open collector output of the comparator circuit. So when that the output of the comparator falls, because that's the input to the Arduino, we want it to trigger this little this little event. Okay. Um, start equal to millis. This is the uh, a uh, the free running counter on the Arduino in milliseconds. Uh, we're going to begin the serial um, port, and we're going to do an LED pin mode four. Okay, so we have an LED on the output. Let's go into the loop here. Um, all right, let's just say we get an event. That means we're jump down to here to void Geiger count. Geiger event equals one is the first thing I do. I set this value, this variable equal to one because it's always zero right out of the gate. So we set that to one and then we do a count store second plus plus. I know that's a lot to handle. We have an array of counter store here second, if you could see here, equal to 60. That means we basically have 60 variables within count store. So count store zero, count store one could be a variable within it. There's an integer inside that array that's 60 variables long or however you want to call it. Okay, so wherever sec is at, it could be at zero, could be one, two, three, it's going to increment that. All right, anyways, this will make sense in a second. All right, here we go. If Geiger event is equal to one, because we just set it to one, we go back to our loop. Say I want to keep my code inside the interrupt very, uh, very short. I don't want to sit there and drag things out in there too long because in another interrupt event could happen while I'm executing code. So I just want it to do its thing really quickly. And then if something happens over here and it needs to jump out, go ahead, jump out. I don't care because I'm really just concerned with counting these events. Okay, so what we do first is we light up the LED, delay for 100 milliseconds, and then we do a tone on pin 3 uh, at 600 hertz for 1 millisecond. So that's what gives you that nice little click sound. Uh, then we make the LED go low, set the Geiger event to zero. That way this doesn't happen again until uh, we get another Geiger event. Now, here's the complicated code. This is how we're measuring the counts per minute rolling in real time every second it increments. Remember millis up here when I set it to start? This is continuing to go on. So when this minus this, when I started it, is greater than a thousand, we have elapsed a thousand milliseconds or one second. So every one second this will execute. What we do is we increment the sec here, which started at zero. So second zero counts have been stored in that value. Okay, so then we increment it up by one. So now we're at second one, or the, you know, the second right after that. We'll come back to this here in a second. Um, then we set, since we incremented it, we want to clear that out, that value in that array to zero. We set the CPM to zero, which is counts per minute. And then we do this little loop, which sums up all of the counts per minute. So we go CPM is equal to CPM plus count store of I. So it goes all the way from 0 to 59. So that gives you 60 counts or 60 values. So that's 60 seconds worth of counts. And each one, each, well, this is kind of where things get a little crazy. So each second you could have multiple counts. And that's the whole reason we're doing this. Okay. Then... We go through this whole loop here and then do a serial print of that total. And then we restart the start variable back to the mill the current milliseconds. So this could happen again. All right. So this goes through it, this whole sequence 59 times. Once it goes through it 59 times or 60 times or whatever, we do this little thing here and set it back to zero. So it's a rolling counter, you know. So it's like we're constantly going from 0 to 60 back to 0, and we're not erasing out any of the old stuff. So anytime you get an update here, you're going to look. So it's like 
this happens right now and we get the value, we're getting 60 seconds worth of counts, no matter what at what point you're looking at. So it's kind of cool. You know, it's not like we count up to 60 and then shoot out the counts per minute. We're giving it to you in real time. So if I give you the counts right now, that's going to be 60 seconds worth of counts. So it truly is always counts per minute, if this makes sense. So it's kind of cool. I'm sure, I, you know, I might have some errors in here that might have to be 60 or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Or even worse is if while I'm doing this, we get a Geiger event, which is very likely. Then we kind of dump some things out here and we sort of lose that accuracy a little bit. But it's not a big deal. And for the most part, the code works. Okay.